Good afternoon. We are officially starting the webinar. My name is Jana Fleming, and I'm with Erickson Institute in Chicago, Illinois, and I'm also a member of the National Pre-K Third Grade Work Group. I am pleased to welcome you to the National Pre-K Third Grade Work Group webinar series entitled Reducing Achievement Gaps by Fourth Grade, the Pre-K Third Approach in Action, which is comprised of seven webinars, each highlighting a critical component of the Pre-K Third Approach. Today is the first of the series of seven sessions being conducted over this calendar year. The format for each session will include presenters on key issues in pre-K third grade education, as well as the opportunity for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. I will be moderating the session, introducing each speaker, and facilitating the question and answer portion during the last 20 to 25 minutes of the session. This session is also going to feature a polling process. I'd like to take a moment to explain how that and the Q&A section and segment at the end are going to work. Both are actually quite simple. For the polling, at intervals during the session, we will pose questions to you in the audience uh, for immediate feedback. This will mostly happen between presenters. The question will appear on your computer screen, and you simply have to check the answer. For the question and answer segment, you will notice a chat box on the right-hand side of your computer screen. Simply type in your answer and, and I'm sorry, simply type in your question and press submit. We will sort through the questions during the presentation and try to address as many as we can during the QA segment at the end. Today's session is entitled Progress and Possibilities, the Third Grade Approach. Um, the pre-K third approach. As the first session of the series, this is really intended to set the stage. Um, and lay the foundation for how we define pre-K third grade work. Our hope is that this session will paint a big picture that provides a framework and context for the pre-K third grade approach and offers some perspective on how this work looks for both school-based partners and non-school partners. We acknowledge ahead of time that some of the material presented today may seem somewhat generic and specifically practice-based. I'd like to point out that we believe this information will be useful framing and data for bringing in new partners, writing proposals to support your own pre-K third grade initiative, or instituting larger educational reforms. The first speaker for this session is Tom Schultz, who will outline the rationale for pre the pre-K third grade approach. Tom Schultz is project director of early childhood initiatives at the Council of Chief State School Officers. Following Tom will be Christy Cowers, who will provide an overview of the pre-K third grade approach outlining its core components and what it is not. Christy Cowers is Program Director, Pre-K Third Education at the University of Washington. Following Tom and Christy's presentations, we will have two presenters who look at Pre-K Third in action. First, we will hear from Sharon Ritchie, who will provide a school perspective. Then we will hear from Tanja Rucker, who will talk about the role of non-school partners. Sharon Ritchie is Director of First School, at the Frank Porter Graham Child Development Institute at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Tondra Rucker is Principal Associate for Institute for Youth, Education, and Families at the National League of Cities. So before we start with the presenters, let's turn to our first polling question. In the first polling question, we're interested in learning more about who is on the webinar right now. So here goes. Okay, well, thank you for participating in the poll. I think um, we're ready to get started with Tom Schultz. Free reform. Uh, as Jana was mentioning the other presenters that uh, you're going to be hearing from. I realized that um, each of them, in some in a different way, is going to present kind of a an appeal for um, why the pre-K three initiative makes sense. Um, Christy, who's going to talk about um, the, the issue of alignment, um, I think 
is kind of presenting a really important logical case um, for lining up the standards and assessments and data and professional development efforts across um, early childhood and uh, public early public school years. Um, from Sharon Ritchie, you're going to hear a lot about the importance of a common culture uh, among the educators that work in in various community-based early care and education programs. Um, and and Tanja Russell from the National League of Cities, I think, reflects uh, an important perspective of general purpose government that is funding um, this wide range of institutions that work with kids. And quite naturally, um, it, occurred, it seems to them logical and important that, that we all kind of work together. Uh, what I'm going to try to do in uh, my time, if I can get my button here to work, is um, to talk first with you about um, the importance of what we know about young children um, during this uh, period of time and um, what they're looking like in terms of their characteristics as they're coming into our early childhood programs, kindergarten and primary grade programs, and then um, also what we know about how well they're doing in terms of uh, meeting goals for uh, developing in a healthy fashion uh, and learning on par with uh, our standards and expectations for them to be successful in school. Um, and it seems to me, as, as many of you are aware, uh, working in local communities and folks that work at the state or national level, um, three, kind, th three things kind of stand out when you look at what we know about demographic characteristics as well as um, the issues of, of trajectories of children's learning and development is that we're increasingly seeing um, a rise in, in risk factors and disadvantage uh, characteristics. We're seeing more and more diversity in the population of young learners. Uh, and we're seeing substantial and persistent and glaring disparities in terms of, of how uh, young children with disadvantaged backgrounds um, are looking uh, as contrasted to their more advantaged peers. Uh, I hope you can see my slides. I'm going to try to keep on going here. Looks like this is better. Um, so let's let's uh, focus on this on the on the first one of the characteristics I mentioned: increasing um, rates of disadvantage and risk factors. And I think many of you are aware of the increase in uh, in poverty rates. I think what's important to also stress is that uh, children who are um, in low in, in in homes with where where there's low income, poverty level, or slightly above that, don't just come with that uh, challenge in terms of the environment that they're in um, in their early years, but they also almost always have a number of other risk factors. This is a slide from a, a national survey done on a representative sample of infants, toddlers, and preschoolers in uh, for kids who were born in, in the year 2001. So today they are uh, they're sixth graders in public schools. So a study of 11,000 um, young children. And, and what it shows is that um, out of a total number of about a million and a half infants um, we have who, who are either at poverty level or at 200% of poverty in that range, 0 to 200% of poverty, um, the majority of those students have um, a number of other risk factors. And the risk factors that were listed here included a low parental education, a single parent household, or a language minority household. So um, we've got you know thousands and thousands of classrooms of children that are coming to both early childhood and, and early public school experiences with um, a number of risk factors that, that make it harder for them to thrive and, and be successful at learning. Um, similarly, if we look at issues of diversity, um, we see increasing uh, populations of children. This slide is taken from uh, a, a wonderful project at the Urban Institute that's focusing on data on immigrant children and families and looking in particular at young children birth to age eight that are our focus in the pre-K to three years. Uh, they, they show that we've doubled the numbers of children of recent immigrant families um, between 1990 and, and 2008. Um, so we have over 8 million, nearly 9 million children in, this, in, the, in these early years. Um, and that this increase basically represents 100% of the growth of 
the total population of young children during that time span. Um, it further highlights the fact that these families that come from uh, the largest number from Mexico, but from dozens and dozens of countries from, from all continents, um, are disproportionately likely to grow up in poverty. Um, quite a number of them have parents with low levels of education, and they also tend to be English language learners or, or dual language learners. So along with um, the issues of um, disadvantage as, uh, and, and um, diversity, I think uh, what I'm going to cover in the remainder of my time is what some of the key things we know about issues of, of the achievement gap in the early years. Uh, and I think what we're learning, um, and it's what's being corroborated in study after study, is that the issue of the achievement gap that we highlight in our school reform efforts, beginning with assessments of kids in fourth grade, begins very, very early. In fact, it begins um, to be documented um, with statistically significant differences uh, well before children enter the typical pre-K programs at age three or four. And we also know that these early disparities are linked to um, what happens for children during their school career and, in fact, um, in terms of their life chances and, and adult outcomes as well. So um, to start with, I'm going to show you, I think, what may be one of the only moving slides in this afternoon's presentation, a famous uh, study that was done uh, by two professors at University of Kansas with a group of about 80 infants um, beginning in the late 1980s. And, um, with a wonderful study uh, in, in, in households and in other settings where the children work, um, showed the disparities in terms of children's vocabulary growth, the, the, the words that they used and were able to understand um, based on interactions with their parents and other caregivers. And as you can see in this slide, while um, in the first year, 16 months of life, there's, there's not a major difference in terms of, of what was measured in this study. Uh, as early as two years of age, you can see um, these lines tend to um, diverge to diverge from each other. And, and by um, 36 months or three years of age, just when the kids would begin a typical pre-K program, we've got a huge disparity between children of uh, low-income families, working class, and college-educated parents. So, um, I think that this study, when it was done, was certainly used significantly in advocacy efforts to expand programs for infants and toddlers. I think it's uh, something that should give us pause in terms of uh, the need to change the way we do business in terms of the totality of our early childhood and early schooling programs. Um, just to make sure this information is corroborated with other studies, I'm showing you here some data from um, the National Survey, uh, the Early Childhood Longitud Longitudinal Survey, birth cohort that was also mentioned um, earlier um, in the earlier slide and disadvantage, looking at two-year-olds, uh, 11,000 of them um, that were assessed looking at both vocabulary and an early measure of, of early math in matching discrimination on the far right. You can see substantial differences in expressive and uh, and receptive vocabulary um, as early as two years of age uh, so that it wasn't just true in Kansas with the group of kids that happened to be studied by Hart Grizzly, but it's true uh, for kids all over the country. Um, following this by looking at kids at the beginning of kindergarten, um, again with uh, a nationally representative survey uh, of thousands of kids, you can see differences um, for both um, children who differ in terms of their economic backgrounds, but also um, some fairly sizable differences between um, white children, African American children, and Hispanic children. Um, I don't know if this is true for you or not, but uh, one of the questions I often have when I look at these studies or other studies where they talk about effect sizes or you see bar graphs and you see numbers without knowing exactly what those scales represent is, well, how big are these gaps really? terms of, um, of what they mean as far as uh, what kids are able to do and, and how big the gap is between uh, kids at these different levels. So 
these are this is two final um, slides on this issue in terms of the early childhood years. And uh, the first is taken from a paper by uh, Gene Laser that looked at data um, that was gathered on about 8,000 low-income children uh, in the early 1990s that were involved either in the Comprehensive Child Development Program or in Even Start. Uh, and what they found was that um, using a method of equating the scores with uh, with national population results, that low-income children were entering school basically a year behind national norms. So if we're thinking about helping kids to be successful on standards at the end of kindergarten, um, as there is now coming into play with the common core standards that states have been adopting, um, they would need to be able to make two years worth of progress within their single year of kindergarten in order to catch up to their same age peers. One other fact that I think is striking to me that came out of the Head Start Impact Study, uh, both children who had been involved in Head Start and a comparison group who had gone to other kinds of early childhood programs or tracked till the end of kindergarten, um, the study found that 40% of them did not know all their letters of the alphabet by the end of kindergarten. So these are kids who have been in early childhood programs for at least a year, in many cases two years. They've been in kindergarten for a whole year and um, 35 to 40 percent of them had not gotten to that level of letter uh, word identification knowledge by the end of kindergarten. The prospects for them to be successful in first grade, um, I think, would, would lead us to be, you know, would lead us to be concerned. And finally, um, in terms of how these uh, disparities track as kids move through the pre-K three years. Um, in this wonderful campaign that the NEKC Foundation has been um, leading for the past few years on reading on grade level by fourth grade. Um, we see national data from the National Assessment of Education Progress, which shows that um, only roughly half, a little less than half of any of our groups of children are reading on grade level by fourth grade. But for both low-income children and, and several of the key minority groups, um, it's, it's really you know, kind of scary or heartbreaking to see that um, their, being, their ability to be successful um, on these grade level tests is as low as it is. Uh, only 14% of African American students of any income level um, are being successful on grade level reading at the end of fourth grade a little bit more for Hispanic children. I think the results for African American males are something like only 8%, 7 or 8% of them are being successful. So we don't have kind of a small problem in terms of the issues of equal opportunity and uh, getting kids to, to the point where they're likely to be successful in the remaining of the remainder of their school career. We have you know, a giant problem in my uh, mind in terms of the achievement gap, how early it starts, and how substantial it is. Um, as many of you are probably aware, what goes on in these early years does um, have sustained effects in terms of later education and adult outcomes. Um, unfortunately, two, three quarters of the kids who, who are not successful in terms of reading on grade level at fourth grade um, don't catch up in spite of efforts of teachers in grades four and, and up. Uh, this is a strong predictor of, of eventually dropping out of high school uh, and is, is likely to lead to very limited employment uh, opportunities for, for adults if they don't overcome this, this problem. So what this leads me to say is to basically pose um, three questions to all of you. It looks like my mouse fell off. <laughs> but, uh, the three questions are whether we as educators are sufficiently alarmed and focused on this issue of achievement disparities in the early childhood years, whether in the programs and schools that are serving kids during these years, we're giving parents honest feedback um, on how well their kids are progressing. And then finally, um, does this evidence lead us to be willing to join together uh, in terms of a partnership between early childhood programs and people who work in the early school years um, to kind of share accountability for this problem. 
And I think as our as our logo emphasizes, our view is that every year matters, that we may not be able to expect any single year of early childhood education uh, to eliminate the achievement gap. We think cumulatively and collectively, uh, it's an important goal for us to do everything we can to work together to minimize and prevent this pattern of achievement gap, achievement gaps and disparities that have been with us for so long. So with that, I'll turn it back to Jana and uh, hope our, our technical glitches didn't detract too much from you following what I had to say. Thanks a lot. Um, thank you very much. That was it's a very succinct but very clear presentation of reasons why policymakers and practitioners need to think differently about reforms on the early end of the ed, um, education continuum. So as we're transitioning um, speakers, let's turn to our second polling question, which I see is already up. Um, I'll pause for a minute or so for you to do the second polling question, and then we're going to move to our next speaker. Okay, I think we're ready. Um, now we're going to turn to our second presenter, Christy Cowers of the University of Washington. Thank you, Jana. Uh, and before I launch into my presentation, we thought we would also show you the results from the first poll so that you can see who all is participating in the webinar today and the diversity of um, primary area of work that is uh, being represented on the phone. We have a good spread of folks from the birth to five and across the full birth to eight spectrum represented. Okay, so thank you very much um, for joining us today. I um, have the pleasure of getting to provide sort of a conceptual framework for this pre-K through third work and to help define how we in the National Work Group think about this pre-K through third grade reform vis-a-vis -vis some of the other efforts going on in the field. So the best way to think about pre-K through third is an effort that improves each grade level and then also aligns across grade levels. So this is the graphic that I like to use the most to indicate both that within approach and across approach. And I'll dig more deeply into this in just a few moments. But first I want to offer a definition of pre-K through third reform. Uh, we like to think about this as a continuum of learning that spans traditional boundaries of the pre-kindergarten experiences and the early grades. One really important definitional issue here, though, is how we use the word pre-kindergarten. We do not see it as a singular program or just a school-based program, but more as an adjective that describes the wide variety of learning-based programs that children experience before they enter kindergarten or pre-kindergarten. So pre-K for us does indeed include school-based um, preschool programs but also community-based programs, Head Start programs, family child care settings, and other learning-based uh, opportunities that children have. There's been a lot of rhetoric in the field lately about what these early childhood and early learning reforms should be accomplishing. And especially in policy circles, the uh, primary focus has been on literacy achievement and reading on grade level by the end of third grade. While we certainly think that's important, we see these pre-K through third years as having really three primary goals. The first is, yes, to develop these strong foundational cognitive skills in literacy and communication and math. And interestingly, with math, uh, more and more research is actually showing that math performance at the end of third grade is more highly predictive of later school success even than reading achievement. 
Um, so we do believe that these are the years where we need to be laying those strong foundations in literacy and math. But we also believe that these are the years where we need to be developing children's social and emotional competence, making them not only eager learners, but also um, helping them to be resilient, um, to be able to work in groups, to no negotiate conflict, to work with peers, um, and to interact with adults. This is those these are those years, birth through age eight, when those skills are also being laid. And then finally, the third focus for pre-K through third should be to establish patterns of engagement in school and learning. And while, yes, this is about young children's engagement in school and learning, and focusing on their attendance and participation in these learning programs, but it's also about family engagement in really beginning to lay the patterns and habits of parents being instructional partners for their children and not just potluck participants at school events. So with these three um, primary focus areas of pre-K through third, we still believe that the primary leverage for this is focusing on what happens inside classrooms and ensuring that we have really high quality instruction and rich learning environments for young children. So I want to talk a little bit more about those alignment variables. Um, the first dimension of alignment that we think about in pre-K through third is horizontal alignment. And this is when we want to ensure that we have um, equitable, high quality opportunities within each grade level for young children. Now, this um, needs to happen at every, um, at every year. Uh, it's probably no surprise to anyone on the phone that um, you can walk into any elementary school and visit four different second grade classrooms and very often see a wide diversity of quality learning experiences. Some children are in highly didactic environments where it's a lot of solo work um, and it's a very teacher-directed approach. Whereas the classroom right next door might be a much, much more diversified learning environment where children are in small groups and there's peer-to-peer -peer learning and much richer adult-child interaction. We need to be thinking about how to get all of those second grade classrooms to a similar level of quality that is conducive to young children's uh, learning and growth. We also need to be thinking about horizontal alignment in these preschool years, and those years before children actually enter the kindergarten doors. And this is where horizontal alignment becomes a little more tricky, only because we have to be looking at alignment across a lot of different delivery systems. Some children will be entering kindergarten from school-based pre-K. Others will be entering kindergarten from Head Start. Others from community-based or family-based child care programs some directly from family. So one of the challenges, and something that the Birth to Five field has been working on um, deeply for the last five to 10 years, is thinking about how to raise the quality of all of these different delivery systems and help to build smooth transitions from each of these into kindergarten. So that's a way to conceptualize thinking about horizontal alignment. The second dimension of alignment we like to think about is vertical alignment. And this is that notion of creating a ladder of learning or a um, somewhat predictable sequence of what children are expected to know and be able to do um, from year to year. There has been a lot of talk lately around the vertical alignment of learning standards as the Common Core has come to be, and many states are now grappling with how to align their early learning standards with Common Core standards. So that is a very prevalent um, way to think about vertical alignment. But we think vertical alignment also needs to be addressed when we think about professional development. Are our community-based pre-K providers having an opportunity to join kindergarten, first, second, and third grade teachers in professional development settings? Are we creating vertical teaming approaches where teachers can work together across grade levels in order to support their own professional development and to support the learning of the children in their classrooms? So vertical alignment is something that can be addressed in multiple ways. 
So when we put the pieces together of pre-K through third, we want to be focusing on the quality of all of those pre-kindergarten programs. We want to be focusing on the quality of kindergarten. And we won't spend much time talking about it today, but we do believe that full-day kindergarten is um, a necessity in this day and age. And we still have many states that do not um, guarantee a full day of kindergarten to many children. And then we need to be focusing on the high quality of those early grades, grades one, two, and three. And so in our pre-K through third reform approaches, what we do is we take all of those disparate pieces and align them so that we are creating a um, continuum of learning for young children. And what this means is there is no silver bullet. Every single year matters. And so we need to be focusing not just on four-year-olds, not just on five-year-olds, not just on six-year-olds, but across the full continuum. A second important takeaway point is that we need to be improving the quality of these learning opportunities. It's not just creating new standards. It's not just um, creating new teacher credentials. But it's really guaranteeing that we are changing the quality of the learning experiences that children have. And then third, we need to increase the continuity and improve the alignment across these grade levels, um, both horizontally and vertically. Um, one way I like to think about pre-K through third reforms is um, in thinking about children's toys, in that many reform efforts in the past have viewed these, um, this age range like building blocks, where we focus on creating a really high quality pre-K program, and we can then be proud and set that aside as a nice, neat, tidy blue block. Then we turn to think about kindergarten, and we create a high quality kindergarten program, and we think about that as a separate block, um, a red block, for example. And then with each additional year. So we've focused on the independent parts, but we haven't figured out how they go together. I think a better way to think about pre-K through third is to think about pop feed where each grade level or each age level can be its own independent piece and have its own nuances and its own um, personality, so to speak, but that we're also really being intentional about thinking how those grade levels connect together, what are the transitions and the children need to experience from grade to grade and program to program, what are the linkages that teachers need across grade levels, so that we can create a strand of pop beads that hold together as a continuum, but are flexible enough to meet the needs of young children. Um, the next six webinars in this series are going to tackle the specifics um, much more deeply than we can do today. But I do want to quickly highlight some of the um, specific handholds that we see that exist in these pre-K through third approaches. Um, one is to actually establish mechanisms or ways to do this kind of cross-sector alignment work. That means ensuring that we have work groups, committees, task forces um, at the school level, at the district level, within communities, who are really dedicated to thinking about these issues. A second step is to think about our administrators, whether it be principals and superintendents, or Head Start directors and child care directors, or um, resource and referral specialists, but thinking about how we are engaging administrators as leaders in this work and helping them to be, um, to have a deeper understanding of child development and understand how to support teachers of young children. Um, third, we need to, there's been a lot of focus on individual teachers in education policy reform lately. Um, we prefer to think about teachers as teams that work together and finding ways for teachers to learn together in professional development and to work together to improve their own practice and to focus on the needs of young children is important. A fourth way is to think about the instructional tools and make sure that those are aligned. This is in thinking about curricula, instruction, and assessment. A fifth mechanism is to think about the environments in which our children are actually learning. The birth to five world has been very intentional about this as they think about building quality rating and improvement systems. The K3 world, I think, has been less intentional about thinking about the quality of the environment and are we creating classrooms and campuses 
that allow for children full um, learning and development, including outdoor playtime and recess. Um, a sixth step is to be smart about data and assessments, and to use it not just because everyone says we need to be using data right now, but to be dis um, very discerning about how much data is collected and how it is used. And we think that data really should be primarily used to improve instruction. Um, seventh is engaging families. And again, not just engaging families in a token way, but really helping them to be active participants in their children's learning. And then finally, ensuring that children are actually moving through a pathway, pre-K through third. So this is thinking about where do um, children in a particular child care center, what school are they going to be attending, and ensuring that we are creating linkages and alignment between that child care program and, and a school. So this is, again, thinking about children's pathways through the system. So in closing, I want to leave you with this image of mine of pre-K through third as being an endeavor that improves each grade level and aligns across grade levels. And now I think we're going to turn to a polling question, and then we'll um, take a few minutes for questions and answers for Tom and or me before we turn to Sharon and Tanja. So that is, com that is um, correct. So the next polling question, the second question, has appeared on your screen. Why don't you take a minute to look at that. And while you're doing that, I'll just um, say thank you to Christy for providing us with of so this conceptual understanding of what pre-K third is and why every year matters um, in the early grades. And just so the presenters can be prepping, I have a question for both Tom and um, one for you as well, Christy, that I'll be posing once the polling is over. Okay. Mom, are you ready for a question? Shoot. Okay. A question has come in for you, Tom, asking why there's such a focus on children at risk, you know, ELLs or DLLs, children in poverty, et cetera. Shouldn't pre-K third be targeted to all children? I think absolutely. It's a it's a effort that would benefit and will benefit all kids. I think um, my approach was to try to present you know an argument that would persuade educators in the schools and in the early childhood community uh, about the need to consider this reform if if they haven't already done so. I think um, I think the achievement gap is a huge priority as it should be in public education based on No Child Left Behind, um, based on the data that uh, has been generated over the past decade um, about the costs of the achievement gap. Uh, and, and I think that the early childhood community, in my view, needs to kind of get a little even a little bit more concerned about it. But I think that the concepts that, that are inherent in pre-K-3 you know, are sound and apply to all children and are needed um, as a way of changing the way we do business. Um, so I was, I think, trying to present a rationale for um, changing the way we do business, but I wouldn't want to limit the application of PK3 just to uh, at-risk kids. Good question. But thank you very much for that answer. I think that was very clear. Um, and kind of along that a similar vein in terms of you know who is and who isn't you know privy to uh, the great things that pre-k3 has to offer there's a question I want to present to you Christy which has to do with you know what about infants and toddlers why aren't they more prominent in this model uh, another good question that actually I often get 
Um, infants and toddlers obviously are very important um, to this developmental continuum. In fact, if you look at brain research science, they are probably perhaps the most important in terms of thinking about laying those critical foundations for cognitive and social and emotional learning. Um, the reason they're not more prominent in this model is because I think some of the alignment efforts are different when you have infants and toddlers engaged um, or when you're thinking about infants and toddlers. So uh, one example is when we're thinking about learning standards. Most states now have early learning standards for children beginning at birth all the way to school entry and then obviously every state has K-12 learning standards. When we are thinking about aligning learning standards, absolutely we need to be thinking about infants and toddlers and ensuring that those standards are part of the alignment effort. When, however, we think about something um, a little more uh, tangible and closer to uh, children and family, and in particular school experiences. Um, so here I might be thinking about the role of school principals or district superintendents in um, taking time to build really meaningful relationships with child care programs um, and other preschool, community-based preschool settings in the community. If there are settings um, that are predominantly serving infants and toddlers, I'm not sure that is a priority for where we should be placing our K-12 administrators um, focus and, um, and time. Obviously, they need to know where those children are. It would be nice for them to be including those infant and toddler teachers and professional development opportunities. But in terms of really prioritizing where very limited school-based resources, um, whether they be fiscal resources or time and human resources are to be placed, I think infants and toddlers um, are a little bit of a different situation. So this is where we need to be I'm very thoughtful about including infants and toddlers where it makes most sense, um, but not um, always including them where it might um, be too much of a strain or actually lose some buy-in from key stakeholders altogether. But another good question, and I think these are really thoughtful conversations for every um, sort of district and community-based effort to be um, having on their own. Well, Christy, thank you for that very thoughtful answer. And I'm going to go ahead and um, proceed with our presentation. But I do want to mention to the audience, we have several questions that have come in that I've asked for more specifics about how this is done in the classroom and the curriculum and issues like that. That um, Some of that will be touched on in the next two presentations, or at least the next presentation, and then in further webinars. And so with that, I will now turn to our third presenter, Sharon Ritchie from the FPG Child Development Center. Good afternoon. Let's see, my screen is showing up here. So I want to begin by answering Tom, one of Tom's questions and saying in terms of first school in our work is yes, we were sufficiently alarmed by what we were seeing happening particularly to our minority and um, kids living in poverty. And first school is our response to that. And the second part is that I'm hoping that our work in schools um, really brings life to some of the things or even all of the things that um, Christy was talking about in terms of, of her concept of pre-K-3 education. Um, we're working specifically in eight pre-K-3 schools, and our focus really is on improving the school experiences of African-American, Latino, and low-income children and their families. And we couch it that way because we want to put the responsibility on the schools, on the teachers, on the district, on policy for changing what happens in schools for kids. We've been blaming kids and their families for them not doing well for far too long. And I think this notion of improving their school experiences is very important. Um, we focus on the, the kinds of seamless transitions that Christy was talking about. We're very focused on using data as a source for professional development. And our approach is through collaboration and inquiry. 
we, um, we really want to be responsive to the needs of schools, and the expectations and the burdens on schools are huge. Um, but in order to remain focused on really supporting African-American, Latino, and low-income kids, we went to the research base to find instructional practices that have particularly been shown to be effective in supporting their progress. And so we work, we try to come at our work in these concrete ways that make sense to teachers that are linked to the common core because that's what everybody is thinking about right now. Use data and engage teachers in inquiring into what is happening for their children. So I'm going to give you just a few examples. I have very a few minutes to talk about about seven years worth of work. So um, we really like pulling from the early childhood from about notions of quality and setting up cultures. And so we've couched some of these practices that we found effective for the children that we're focused on in cultures. And the first one is a culture of caring, where what we really want to do is focusing on a culture in which children value themselves, their families, and each other in big ways and small. And one of the ways that we get teachers to really talk about what's happening in their classroom is to present them with data from their very own classrooms and have them look at it and talk about it. We're not there to evaluate them. We're not there to criticize them, but rather to help them think about what's happening for kids in their classroom. So for this graph, we're using the class. Um, which looks, in this case, at the domain of emotional support between pre-K and K classrooms, and really helping teachers think about what is it their children are experiencing in terms of sensitivity, awareness, responsivity, and sort of what, how big that change is for them as they move from pre-K to K, this is in a particular school, and so we had these conversations within a, the uh, context of a particular school. We're very much focused on regard for student perspective. Because we're, we care about kids valuing themselves and knowing that they're smart and capable, is that too often we see that the teachers do not give kids the opportunity to speak, to be engaged, to show who they are, to bring in their backgrounds, to bring in their families. And so we really try and focus on that particular area. In terms of recognizing kids' competence, we're looking at their peer interactions, their self-regulation, and really prioritizing communication. We really see in the Common Core a real push for peer interaction, for opportunities to describe, to ask and answer, to participate in collaborative conversations, to express thoughts and feelings and ideas clearly. And so how does that really happen? And really focusing on self-regulation, because we have so much teacher regulation right now, the kids don't often get the chance to actually develop self-regulation, which really takes attention and practice. It will not happen in days where kids are being told all day, sit down, get in line, hands behind your back. Um, crisscross applesauce. It's in places where kids get the opportunity to learn how to regulate themselves. As a way of talking about some of those, the opportunities for communication, we look at the amount of time that is spent in classrooms on things like oral language development, and I was listening to Tom talk about vocabulary development and um, to Christy talking about the range of experiences that kids have in classrooms. And you see they have a range of from 18 minutes of oral language development to a high of you know, 120 minutes of meaningful interactions between teachers and children in oral language and an average of about 62 minutes. Um, across a whole day, that is not a lot of conversation that happens, especially at this low end, where we see quite a lot. Vocabulary development, um, a low is zero, where there's no intentional vocabulary, and a, 
and an average of about you know 10 minutes a day where that's being attended to. And we saw from what Tom said how very important that is. So these kinds of uh, this kind of data helps teachers really re see in ways they don't usually get to see what's really happening in their classrooms for kids, and then to make some decisions about how to move forward and make some changes. And finally, we want to really work on a culture of excellence. Um, and so again, we turn to the Common Core, where we're really being asked for kids to reason abstractly and quantitatively. They cannot just engage in didactic instruction in order to do this. Kids need to <coughs> construct viable arguments and critique reasoning. And there's a real push to integrate the curriculum. So in order to help teachers think about that, we look at their teaching approaches by content. And we see so much in math that it's didactic instruction. It's teachers who get up and they tell kids information, and they demonstrate, and they but they don't when you have 58% of the day where they are talking to children and only 9% of the day where they are asking children what they know, what they heard, what they understood, then they don't really know because that's such a short percentage of the day that or such a short amount of time that kids are telling them what they know. The teachers aren't getting the kind of formative assessment that they should be able to gain by asking kids more questions, by engaging them more fully in the content. We see, on the other hand, when we move to literacy, where we've had so much more professional development and so much more attention to the fact that there are not always one right, there's not always one right answer, or surely there's not always just one way to get to those kinds of answers, that we have a much better balance between what happens when teachers are teaching literacy than when they're teaching mathematics. So we really help teachers recognize, you know, you have that skill. You know how to scaffold children's learning. How do we move that over and make that part of how you teach math? So these are just some small ways that we try, try to get teachers to collaborate, to work together in grade levels, to really explore what they're doing, as well as use data, and so that you can come back and do these kinds of measures again and find out where the improvements are. Teachers can make intentional decisions about how to, um, about how to move forward. So these are just some of the things that we do at First School, and I hope you found them helpful. Great. Sharon, thank you very much. I think that um, that may go towards answering some of the questions that have come up, or at least shedding some light on, you know, what does this really look like you know, in a pre-K third classroom? Um, really appreciate that. As we transition speakers, we're going to move to our next polling question, which is now on your screen. I'll pause for a minute while you do that. Okay, I think we're ready to move on. Oh, good. We have a result there. Great. Thank you for that feedback. Now let's turn to our last presenter, Tanja Rucker, from the National League of Cities. Hi. Thanks so much, Jana. I appreciate the opportunity to chat with you all today and talk a little bit about how non-school community partners are engaging in pre-K through third alignment work. Um, we are excited about how communities across the country are uh, taking up the, the banner and, and looking for ways to partner with um, communities um, across the country uh, looking to, to engage in pre-K through third work. I want to begin by just talking a little bit about how non-school partners are are engaging in the effort outside of the classroom. 
we all know that alignment efforts um, go beyond the classroom to include strengthening connections within communities and linking families to a broad range of supports and opportunities that help them thrive. Um, it may not be evident to everyone, you know, on those days where we all feel like we're working in silos and there's no one else out there that's, that's trudging along, but there are many different entities that are working to improve both the quality and the alignment of early childhood and elementary school learning experiences. So we all know that a high-quality, well-aligned education system can improve outcomes for children and it can really div um, bridge the divide between community-based early childhood programs and K-12 through programs. And this results in strengthening the local workforce, the local economy, and it also enhances the city's quality of life and overall vibrancy of a city. Well, let's take a look at what the National League of Cities, uh, we, we um, began about um, last year, uh, we, uh, about two years ago actually, the Education Alignment for Young Children project. This was built on a decade of experience promoting municipal leadership in both the early childhood arena and the K-12 system. So in the first half of 2010, the Children, Youth, and Family Institute, we interviewed more than a dozen cities across the country about their efforts to help young children succeed by age eight. We carried out site visits. We spent time on the ground in communities, and we carried out in-depth interviews to examine existing lo local practices and how they were aligning early childhood programs and elementary education in ways that increase the likelihood that children will be posed in position for educational success by the time they reach third grade. So what did we do? What, we, we took a step back. Um, we, we internally, based on our research and what we were hearing from the ground up, we developed a framework that focused and, and really we landed on 10 key elements that were important for a strong pre-K through third alignment strategy. I'm going to share five of those elements with you today and highlight how non-school partners are coming together to advance the work around educational alignment. The first element I'm going to share with you and talk a little bit about today is formal partnership or governance structures that are put in place and formed to develop common definitions and goals and, and help folks and coalitions on the ground take joint action to implement a high quality aligned system. The work in Boston, Massachusetts comes to mind and specifically the, the work by Thrive by Five, Thrive in Five. Um, this is a 10 year initiative that aligned and, and come together to ensure that all children will be ready for sustained school success. Thrive in Five's work is driven by the Boston School Readiness Roadmap. This was developed by more than 100 parents and community leaders doing Thrive in Five's planning process. Some of the key partners in that work was the city of Boston, the Boston Public Schools, families, educators, higher ed folks, folks in the healthcare system, human service providers, the private sector, the business community, and a number of city departments and state agencies. They all came together around this roadmap that outlines goals and strategies to strengthen existing child and family serving systems, to create new supports and to alter systems where needed, and to coordinate and align work across systems citywide. Surviving Five is staffed by an executive director who's housed in the United Way, the mayor's office helped to recruit a cross-sector leadership team to serve as a governing board for Thrive in Five. So this is an example of a, of a structure in place that's really helping move alignment on the ground. Another key element, a second key element that we're going to take a look at that's important to alignment is communication and data sharing. To allow parents, early educators, teachers, and service providers access to common information that will improve how each supports the learning and the development of the children in their care. When I think about communication and data sharing, the city of Jacksonville, Florida comes to mind and some of the interesting work that they have on the ground. So in order to smooth out the various pipelines that lead to schools, um, the, the Success by Design initiative was um, formed in Jacksonville, Florida. And this was formed um, with a partnership through the Duval County Public Schools, the Florida Institute of Education, a number of parent involvement centers and organizations, the school district, and neighboring social service agencies. 
um, the Success by Design initiative actually places a liaison in each neighborhood to facilitate communication between the community and the schools. Additionally, Success by Design addresses the issues of alignment by partnering with Florida State University to create a unified set of data on child indicators that can be linked to the public school system's data. The initiative will use results from a longitudinal study that examined the gains made between pre-K and third grade for a cohort of Duval County children who were enrolled in the Mayor's Book Club Early Education Initiative. So that's an example on the ground of how key partners are coming together to look at communication and data sharing. Another key element of, of alignment is qualified teachers and administrators in both early childhood and in elementary school settings. Seattle, Washington comes to mind when I think about quality teachers and, and administrators. In 2007, the Seattle Early Education Collaborative, which we'll call SEEK, was formed to bring stakeholders together to create a shared vision for early learning in Seattle and to work together to achieve greater gains for children. Part there's a myriad of partners here. I'll just name a few. Of course, the City of Seattle, Seattle Public Schools, the Child Care Resource and Referral Center, Thrive by Five, the University of Washington, the Health Department, the libraries, the Head Start grantees, the state-funded Early Childhood Education Assistance Program, as well as the levy-funded Step Ahead Preschool. All these folks are members of SEEK. And within this group, there was a professional development work group that was formed in 2007. This group meets on a monthly basis. The meetings are co-facilitated by the city and Head Start. And the city provides staff support for this work. The, the professional development work group launched a successful pre-K to third grade professional development program bringing together pre-K teachers, coaches, elementary teachers, literacy specialists, special ed teachers, and English language learners to learn about common instructional strategies. Another key element to look at is alignment of standards, curricular, teaching, practices, and assessments with a focus on both social competence and academic skills and to build on what children have learned and how they've learned it from one level to the next. When I think about this kind of work, I think about the, the work that's going underway in the city of Hartford, Connecticut. Key leaders in Hartford recognize that when curriculum objectives and research-based instructional practices are aligned with established state standards, the common core, young children thrive and they do well. Well, city leaders um, developed a common child report card based on state standards to build and bridge the early childhood system and the public school system. Well, they quickly realized that you know, there was a tremendous gap between what early educators, their administrators and teachers, what they knew either about the state standards as well as what's happening in K-3 systems. So the city stepped back, they reached out to all their partners, and they convened citywide um, professional development opportunities where teachers at all levels would come together and share ideas and learn about curriculum and learn about state standards and what was happening in the school system. Another product of this initiative is that a resource was developed entitled Connecting the Dots of Teaching and Learning. And this is a, a document that really looks at aligning curriculum and assessment framework and it's used for early educators. And an unexpected victory for the city of Hartford here is that um, this really took fire. Institutions of higher ed and early learning consultants throughout the state are using this document for training purposes in child development coursework. And other municipalities across the state are also they're actually purchasing the resource so they can begin thinking about how to do alignment in their own community. And the final key element that we're going to look at today is parent engagement. And what we mean by that is we want to ensure that parents are empowered by their child's first teacher, their most important advocate, and that families have the diverse supports that they need for a safe, healthy, and economically secure household. Once again, we're in Hartford, Connecticut for this example of what, what it looks like on the ground. So right here, the Hartford Family Civic Initiative. It's a new initiative, it's a collaboration between a number of city agencies and the Connecticut Commission on Children. It's designed to more closely align state and city resources to improve outcomes for children and their families. The initiative comprises three strategic areas, which includes parent leadership training, a unified professional development plan for the staff of family-serving agencies, and it also includes a family civics database that benchmarks levels of parent leadership and advocacy activities, professional development of family support staff, 
and it measures the impact of these efforts on child development outcomes. So Hartford is working across the board with higher ed, the business community, the Hartford Public Schools, the Welcome Center is a great partner, the Hartford Foundation, and a number of stakeholders to make sure that parent engagement happens on the ground in Hartford. Well, these are just five of the elements. I hope I was able to highlight some of the diverse non-school partners, how they're coming together to work and promote a strong pre-K through aligned system. I do want to note that all of these partnerships, they have to be nurtured. They're at various stages of development. And if you went into any of these cities and talked to these folks, they would say they're challenges. And certainly, you know, when you're working with different partners, you have to be sensitive and in tune to the needs of individual organizations. So partnership is something that the non-school partners are working on and hoping to nurture as their work continues to move forward. Um, in closing, I just wanted to highlight a couple of common themes for success that we at the National League of Cities that we've noticed as we kind of scanned and did our, our research on what's happening on the ground. It's important that you have long-term commitment and buy-in from communities. Strong support from the mayor and other non-school leaders are critical. You should try to have this broad partnership across diverse stakeholders. And institutionalizing alignment within governance structures is critical because leaders come and go, but the work should continue. Coordination, both within and across systems, are important. Be clear about specifically what is being aligned and what are your goals, and when all possible, have a diverse funding streams that you can draw upon. Key roles for elected officials and other non-school partners, convene policymakers and leaders, set your visions and goals and in a joint and unified way, coordinate efforts, build the political will, use your mayors and your city council members to use their bully pulpit to advance your message achieve early results so that you can kind of use those results to maintain momentum. And then finally, clearly link your pre-K through third grade alignment work with local economic and workforce development goals. And using the, work, the, the information that Christy and Tom shared on the front end in terms of framing your work is a clear way to use that as you move your work forward. So in closing, I want to just thank you and I want to make sure to let you know that we have a document that we're releasing that will capture all of this work in more detail. It will be on the NLC website in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Tanja. I think that um, coupled with Sharon's presentation, you provide us a bit more kind of a tangible look at what pre-K third means um, in Sharon's case in schools and in your case for these non-school partners. And so we have one last, no, not one last, we have one more polling question. We will have one at the end as well that we want to turn to now. It's on your screen. And after that question, um, the polling question is answered by the audience, and I'm going to turn um, to the presenters posing some of the questions that have come from some of you to me um, as part of the question and chat process. So go ahead and take a minute to answer this next polling question, and then we'll move on. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I want to mention one thing before I get to the questions. If any of you would like a recap of the discussion, Lisa Guernsey of the New America Foundation has been live tweeting the entire webinar. And um, that is at hashtag pound P-R-E-K, the num number three. RD. I'll repeat that. Hashtag pound P R E K the number three R D. So thank you for that, Lisa, um, who's also a member of um, the Pre K Third National Work Group. And so as we transition to this Q and A section, um, you know, clearly today's speakers have provided us with much to think about related to the Pre K Third approach and the promise it holds for effectuating change, reducing achievement gaps. So now we're really eager to turn to some of your questions. Um, and so the first question, just follow up on some of the conversation, or some of the topics that Sharon and Tanja mentioned. I'm going to address a question to each of them um, separately, and then I have some more general questions that have come in. So for Sharon, you know, you seem to put a lot of burden on the teachers with the work you've described. 
how can this work be feasibly integrated into the typical school day, week, and year? Oh, well, of course, that's not an easy answer. Um, so, you know, I think we have to go to the big picture. And I think the big picture means really thinking about making good choices about how we spend teachers' time and how we support them to make more effective use of their time. Um, you know, I think that there's, you know, a, a strong push for PLCs, for grade level meetings, all of which, you know, First School is very supportive of. But so often there's a contrived collegiality. There is not the setup of the culture that's necessary to really use those times in a fruitful way. And I think just like we talk about cultures of quality for children, is that we need cultures of quality for teachers. We need to set things up so that teachers, again, are feeling like valued profession, professionals. And where they have a strong sense of self-efficacy, which grows from their um, not only ability, but opportunity to articulate their thinking, to be able to share their ideas, to be able to take risks, to be able to say that things are hard for them, that they need help, to stay focused on some specific areas. So I think it is in the same way we want to change the cultures of what happens for kids in school. I think we have to do that for teachers in order for this not to feel like such a burden. I think teachers who do feel like professionals, who do feel good about themselves, this is why they want to come to work, because they're curious about their kids, because they're interested, and because there's a place for them to really talk about what's good for kids. Hello. Hi, can you hear me now? I can. OK, I'm sorry. The, my mute has been um, misbehaving. So the next question has come in um, that I want to pose to Tanja, who was directed to her. How can we ensure that schools don't just push down inappropriate practices to younger children? Oh, that's, that's a great question, Dana, and, and one that we hear a lot um, from the field. Um, certainly, schools do have their own culture and their way of doing business. and. Uh, working with school districts, especially in communities where there's multiple school districts, can be a challenge. I think where we've seen the, the greatest success is when you kind of start small and you kind of build the relationship uh, with your, your local school district. Um, it's, a, it's important that when you begin a conversation that you come um, organized and you've got your facts and some data and, and you're clear on your message. And I, and I think that when you use um, stakeholders, leaders that are, are respected in the community. Um, it's nice to bring a, you know, two or three of your respected leaders in, and, and plan and try to convene an initial meeting with the school district. And I think you, you don't go blaming them for you know, where you are and you acknowledge what they're doing well and you begin the conversation of how we can help, how can we build upon what you're doing and we want to only enhance the work efforts that you have underway. I think about some of the cities that I highlighted, and it takes time. Uh, certainly the ask should be minimal on the front end. I think the relationship building is critical. Um, it's important to get buy-in not just from the superintendent, but there are other um, leaders within the school district at different levels. Sometimes those are the folks that you may begin to build relationships with, and then you make the big ask as you go. So once again, it's about nurturing relationships. It's about not making the school district feel like, you know, and it's all on them and that you're there to help and assist. And over time, I think, you know, school districts are recognizing that they do need partners in this work and they're looking for ways 
you know, to improve their performance. And when you offer, you know, your assistance and resources and look for ways to, to meet on common ground, it tends to work. But um, I think it's just it's over time and it's, it's slow but steady as you go. Right. And so in many ways you're echoing Sharon's comments about the need in, um, to develop these relationships and nurture the relationships. In her case it was with teachers, in your case it's with these other um, exactly. Exactly. Uh, like this is being pushed on them in any way. Um, do any of the other presenters want to weigh in on this? Um, Sharon or I'm sorry. Yeah, Sharon or Christy, Tom. Okay, not right now. Nope. Um, another question that's come in has to do with um, this sense that much of what's been talked about has been framed around children in urban areas. And someone has asked whether or not there are any notable developments occurring in rural areas that are instructive as well. Like, how do these practices apply in the rural context? What additional barriers exist, et cetera? Sharon, do you want to take a stab at that? Will you say that again? I'm sorry? Will you say that again? A question has come in regarding kind of noting that the presentations have focused a bit on children in urban areas. Uh -huh. different reforms and how they're applied in that urban context. And so this person wants to know about any notable developments that have occurred in rural areas. Ah, okay. That's, that's an excellent barriers question. To rural areas. Um, actually, two of our first school sites are purposely in rural areas um, where we're um, focusing on rural poverty. And so in terms of the, the, the kinds of things we've been talking about in terms of approaches, whether it's, you know, comes from, you know, Tom's data on what kids are needing, you know, in terms of the ones who are living in poverty and Christie's frame and our work with using data and culture of quality is that we're not experiencing very much difference whether we're working in urban settings or rural settings. Um, the conversations around families seem to be more different than the conversations around children. And I think that, um, you know, we also encounter that there's different filters when people talk about poverty than when they talk about race. And people are somewhat careful about voicing biases um, on issues of race, but not at all careful about issues of biases on poverty. And so, it, and really some, you know, some very um, sort of alarming and hurtful statements are made, but it, but the fact that they are made gives us the avenue to really pursue them and to really be able to do real work in changing some stereotypes and some assumptions. So those are the things that we encounter in the differences between rural and urban. Uh, would either of the other presenters want to comment on that? Just follow up a little bit or? Sure, this is Christy. Uh, and I actually agree with Sharon that the rural issues in general are not much different from the urban issues. Um, I think where some of the primary differences are are in the partnerships that are needed in working with community uh, programs and community child-based centers. Uh, so for example, uh, as part of my work with Harvard Graduate School of Education, we're about to publish a case study that looks at two different school districts in Washington State one of them is Nooksack Valley School District, which is um, in a more rural part of the state where they don't have center, community-based, center-based child care or preschool-like programs. And so their approach to thinking about sort of this pathway that all children are coming from as they enter into kindergarten is different. They um, created their own um, collaborative uh, early learning center that serves many of the children that are feeding into the public school system. So I think that the content and the focus of the pre-K through third work is the same. How we think about partnerships and how we think about pathways for children are a little different when we look at rural locations. Right. Okay. Thank you, Christy, for your insights on that. Um, Another question that's come in, I want to ask Tom if he wants to give a first stab at it. Um, this has to do with, you know, the question
question reads, what is the rationale for a pre-K to grade three approach? In this audience member's opinion, it seems like pre-K, K, and first graders would be a more cohesive continuum. So is pre-K third the approach we're recommending because states typically begin academic assessment of kids in grade three? Does it have to do with the importance of learning to read? Or is there something else developmentally unique to children in these years? Or is it a combination of all of that? So why pre-K third versus pre-K one or something else? Sure, well, I, I'd offer a couple comments. Um, I, I do think that the early childhood field for, for many, many years has kind of defined itself as, as a kind of birth to age eight um, continuum in terms of a, a kind of unique set of phases of child development uh, in terms of the theory and the way that they've kind of organized a lot of their training programs. I also think that the point made by the questioner that that there is a kind of policy divide in terms of when we have the onset of, of um, you know, uniform standardized assessments in the schools and a, you know, a kind of high accountability culture. Um, and I think the question that is being hopefully addressed within pre-K to three is, you know, what can be done during this early years to prepare kids for success um, you know, once the hot, you know the, the accountability effort kicks in, um, I don't know, Christy or others that have been involved in some of the history of, of pre K three, you know, want to add to that. But those be two points on, uh, that are on my mind. This is Christy, and I think I agree. I I think one of the most important frames for the pre K through third grade approach is the developmental perspective that all child developmentalists have noted something magical that changes in how children learn right around the age of eight or nine. Um, I think the, a, an easy way for policymakers to remember this is a saying that Jean Schall, a, a reading expert, mentioned is that it's right around that age when children stop learning to read and again or, and they start reading to learn. So there is this uh, approach to learning that shifts right around third grade. I think that's um, the first really important frame. The second is, is that it is in third grade, thanks to No Child Left Behind, that we have a first fairly universal um, assessment that can let us know if we are closing achievement gaps or if we are not. Now that said, I do think it's important to note that we never want to create a cliff off which children fall. So we don't want to only focus on pre-K through third and then not worry about the quality of fourth grade and beyond. We need to be thinking about a full education continuum from birth all the way through post-secondary. But this pre-K through third approach, as I mentioned in my slides, is really the critical time that we lay out those three foundations cognitive learning and social and emotional competence and engagement in uh, school and learning. And this is Sharon and we we considered this quite carefully as we made decisions about what grade levels we wanted to be part of first school and we very intentionally kept third grade because we did not want for our work with teachers to be sort of conceived of, oh, as those little children, and then you just hand them over to us and they're not ready. We wanted to be able to say, you know, if you begin this in pre-K and you work in all these areas, that indeed you are going to see improved test scores in third grade. So we did, we on purpose included them so that we could, you know, maintain some, you know, collegiality across that whole span. Thank you for weighing in on that one as well, Sharon. Um, we are about five minutes from finishing, and I think that means we may only have time for one more question because I do have a few closing comments that I need to make. And so as our last question, um, you know, the question has come, I want to pose this, which has come in from the group, which is, you know, what about family child care? You know, what role does family child care play in this pre-K third approach? Um, 
you know, initially thought I would pose that to Sharon, but Sharon, you just spoke, so I'm not sure if you want to speak again or let one of your colleagues take a stab at that first. Um, I'm happy to talk about it. Um, okay. I'm a I'm a large fan of family child care. Um, I think quality family child care can, you know, really focus on, um, you know, different age groups being together. It concentrates on um, engagement of families and communication. It really, we see a lot of really powerful relationships between the providers and kids from family child care. So I think that we have a, you know, that part of what we do at First School is sort of uniting the best of early childhood, elementary, and special education. So how do you bring in all those positive features from family child care into, you know, into kindergarten? How do we, you know, benefit from the hard work that's done? I think that the difficulty lies in that too often family child care is not networked in any kind of systematic way. And maybe Tanja can weigh in on this. But, um, but how do we, you know, as you think about working with cities and towns and, you know, larger, larger sections, is how do you draw your family child care providers into being part of professional development, into communication, so that they can benefit from all of the other providers and then add their own um, their own um, benefits to the rest of the group. Okay, right. and this this is Tanja, and we we do see that a uh, you know family child care is an important element, and certainly what we found on the ground is that when when some of these coalitions and non school partners or you know, they have their coalitions and they're formed, it's important to have some of the the ambass some of the cultural ambassadors, some of the folks at the neighborhood level that have the credibility with some of the communities. Um, with, that represent the family child care um, um, homes, and and we see that in certain. I think about the city of San Antonio and their efforts intentionally to include family child care. They have, um, according to district council districts, they have training sessions throughout the year in council districts, and the city helps provide transportation. Um, and some of those c cultural ambassadors and those folks that are very credible in the community are the voices and the bridges to bring in those family child care um, folks to the professional development opportunities because there's a large number of children are in family child care and want to make sure that we're reaching those providers as well. And so having um, training sessions within neighborhoods and within council districts, providing some child care and having those key, um, and the training done in the language of, of, of non-English speakers and at times of the day and the evening where folks are home and at different flexible times throughout the um, the day there's trainings available and we've seen great success and there's concerted effort to include family child care providers and outreach and professional development. Okay. Well, unfortunately we've run out of time. Um, you know, I want to thank all of our presenters, or each of our presenters, you know, for today. I think they've really provided us with good thinking in and around the topic of progress and possibilities for the pre-K third approach. I also want to thank the audience members for your thoughtful questions and your insights. Um, I want to address a couple of things that have come up before I move into my final words of closing. Um, obviously, there are many more questions posed than we were able to answer today. Um, what we're going to do is try to come up with a strategy for answering more of your questions. However, kind of the untold story about this work group is that we're all doing this on a volunteer basis. And so we don't have a strategy yet worked out for future communication in response to all these questions. So bear with us. We'll come up with something. But I do want to point out that future webinars will be addressing a number of the questions that came in that deal with what teachers can be doing and should do, what principals and superintendents must be doing, how to work with different groups. Um, those will all be addressed to some extent in future sessions as well as questions about financing and the expense of this. Um, our last session will be focused on financing and resourcing resources for carrying out pre-K third. Um, and then a host of people have asked whether or not the webinar, um, whether the, this webinar will be available on our website, and it will be. So you'll have access to the presentation you know, via the website once this is over. So thanks again for those thoughtful questions. Um, our next webinar is entitled School Administrators, Pre-K-3rd Instructional Leaders. 
Among other things, that session will include sharing strategies for providing superintendents and principals with the professional development and support they need to ensure high quality pre-K third experiences. This, um, that session will take place on April 3rd at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, we invite you to visit our website to learn more about the next and future webinars as well as work, um, the work of the members of the National Pre-K Third Work Group. And so we're going to end with a last polling question. Um, and then we'll end, I guess, finally we'll end up having our website information up posted once again at the end of this, final, um, following this last polling question. Tiana, could I interrupt and ask if it's, it says on the, on the screen that it's April 11th for our next webinar, and you said the 3rd. Which is it? Oh, I'm sorry. It is April, it's late, April 11th at 3 p.m. Thank you, Sharon. Okay. Thank I you. Got jumbled in my notes. I appreciate your clarifying that. And so we now have the last polling question, which again is our effort to get some feedback from you. And I'm going to end with that. And you know, thank you again for joining us. We really appreciate your support and interest in this topic.